Hi, and welcome to the SIF podcast, where we discuss advice and solutions for the modern therapist while trying to help the public find the right advice and treatment. I'm your host, Mike James. Welcome to episode nine, and I'm delighted to introduce Owen Murray from UA92. Welcome, Owen. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much for having us, inviting us on to chat with yourself and your network. Oh, that's our pleasure. So for the listeners, we were uh, introduced to a mutual connection. And almost immediately, with some correspondence, we realised there's a lot of stuff that we have in common and a real potential for collaborating. And all we wanted to do first was have a little chat for about 30 minutes to introduce you, the organisation, and to discuss some of the common themes that we share that could help therapists and other healthcare professionals. So if you wouldn't mind, just give a quick overview of yourself to start off, your background, um, what you do, where you're at, and the journey that you've been on to get to where you are. Yeah, excellent, sure. Um, I suppose my background was from uh, south of Ireland, started uh, my undergraduate studies on a course called Health and Leisure Studies. Um, it was quite a broad course, and there was lots of, I suppose, similar components to sport and exercise science courses. Um, it's a four-year honours degree programme um, where I graduated from the Institute of Technology through Tralee. It was great foundation and um, the variety of programmes and modules that we got to the study there and the expert staff guidance that we got. So that was kind of the founding phase. I was lucky when I was there to also work with a couple of individuals that um, are still practicing and well renowned at home, whether that be um, May Frawley or Joe O'Connor, they gave me a great opportunity to get up and running, I suppose, find my feet on the ladder of where it was I wanted to go. Um, that gave me a, a taste uh, for going along the lecturing route. So when I was in IT Tralee, um, I was fortunate enough to get opportunities in my final year to help some of the academics deliver uh, material to first years. I um, got a little bit of a taste of it, obviously looked at what were the qualifications that were needed if it, that was a career that I was looking to pursue. Um, next stop on the list was a master's. So again, with support with colleagues from IT Tralee, um, reviewing endless amounts of personal statements, applications, et cetera, et cetera, the, the paperwork that went with it, um, I found myself in Cardiff. So not a million miles away from you, I'd say, sir. So um, Una Moynihan there was, it was a great help and helped me get to Cardiff. You may have come across Kevin Morgan, I think, was the course leader at the time. Um, so I did a sports coach and master's degree program at, at Cardiff Metropolitan University. Uh, it was a one-year program. Initially signed up to do the full master's, um, but then actually exited before the dissertation. So I did all thought, thought modules. Um, because towards the latter part of the program, um, an opportunity came up to become a graduate teaching assistant at Leeds Beckett University. Um, so basically, if I was to do the master's dissertation, there would have been an overlap between the PhD start dates, etc. So um, off I went then to Leeds, <laughs> another little journey along the road, uh, ends up in Leeds Beckett University um, and did a graduate teaching assistant role there. Uh, for four years and then for the last kind of year and a half or so um, I've been doing my PhD part-time because uh, I've since started a role at, where you said at the very beginning University Academy 92 in Manchester. So it's kind of like a, a very broad whirlwind overview of being here there and everywhere. <laughs> yeah. As many Irish people have been, well, a, well, a well-traveled nation. So yeah. b- back home you say you mentioned Traley, do you know Derek Griffin? I don't know him personally, but I, I know the name Derek, yeah. Um, yeah, really, really well-respected and established physio who's making fantastic indents in the pain science world and the pain management world, but one of those annoyingly talented runners as well. <laughs> so, um, it, is, it is a small world. You get about and you soon bump into people, and um, I always think certainly from, from a similar sort of um, geographical setup in South Wales, it's always nice when you bump into people from home wherever you end up and realize that everybody's making waves exactly so we've both teased the audience a little bit so far with university academy 92 
that's the big thing that we wanted to introduce the audience to. So let's let's spend some time talking about them. So tell everybody listening what that is. Yeah, I am. So University Academy 92 Manchester, if we're to give it its uh, full title. Um, it was a new university launched uh, last year in September 2019 was our first cohort. Um, so at UA92 or University Academy 92, we have a lovely campus that is directly opposite Lancashire County Cricket Club, um, just down the road from Old Trafford uh, Football Stadium. The, if anyone's familiar with the Manchester area, it's the old Kellogg's building. Uh, so it's repurposed Kellogg building. We've had a uh, whole uplift inside and it's very now contemporary and modern and it's been designed to suit how we deliver. The courses itself, um, I suppose, essentially stand across our business, media and sport provisions. Um, but before we kind of go into the nitty gritty of what I suppose maybe some of your listeners or yourselves are interested in talking to, particularly sport, uh, University Academy 92 is, is very unique. So essentially trying to be a game changer to the education field. Um, the class of 92, so Gary Neville, uh, Ryan Giggs and co are all heavily involved with the setup and delivery of UA92. Also, we are uh, one of our partners and our awarding degree power is through Lancaster University. So it's great to be affiliated with a very reputable uh, top 10 university. And then alongside those, our other partners also include Microsoft, KPMG, uh, and obviously Trafford Council, etc. So we're, we're housed in the middle. Um, so we're very lucky that we're able to draw upon a number of, I suppose, credible and reputable individuals. Um, people, when they ask me, they hear, that, for example, the class of 92, and like, those guys, well, why, why are they involved in a university? Are they just, is it just the publicity stones of PR? And actually, no, the, particularly Gary, I am very much hands-on approach. They're part of the, the board, the leadership team. They, they come in regularly. It's not uncommon to see Gary, Phil, for example, come in floating around our campus, delivering um, guest lectures, sessions, et cetera, to our students. Um, as well, what makes UA92 slightly different and what makes, I suppose, game change, I suppose, trying to offer very much a new approach is our class sizes and also our talent target curriculum. So typically you'll see universities will obviously put, um, I suppose, the academics at the inside and then everything else is bolted on top of it. For us at uh, UA92, the personal and character de development is very much central. That is key. That is the individual. So people, as you well know, relationships, who the individual is and how they develop those key traits, that is what we want to build upon. And then the academic comes alongside that. So this talent target curriculum makes us very unique because individuals also have an opportunity to have a coach. So it's not a typical personal tutor relationship. It's how can we help foster and develop skills that are going to be required across the sector, essentially uh, desirable employability skills to make that individual the best version of them. Yeah. And, and when I was learning about you in 92, my personal background really resonated with that. My personal background was, um, I came from a military background and a sports background. And there was a period of time where my connections and my network far outweighed my academic skill level. And I was able then to bolt on the academic side to that, which is obviously a the reverse of the traditional model. Most people layer themselves up in academia and in qualifications to then try and foster the network. So I, I really resonated with that. Certainly as a football fan, um, I remember, um, and he was kicking himself because he's a football fan. So I remember speaking to Malcolm after you guys had spoken and he was telling me about you guys. And almost immediately I went, oh, is this anything to do with class of 92? And he went, oh, I didn't even ask. Uh, and then he was like, oh, of course it is. How did I miss that? <laughs> so I think for that more astute, maybe the North sort of based person or someone within the football background, they, they will jump on that. And for those who don't know as much about the class of 92, then they certainly are far more than a bunch of ex-footballers. Um, if you're familiar with watching things like uh, the Salford City programme that was made regarding the football team that they own. 
They are innovative. They are hands-on. Gary Neville is definitely proving to be a remarkably impressive individual. Everything he does is is very, very, very impressive, and and he is someone that almost through association you have to. Uh, there's a certain level of standard that you will expect from the things that he he deals with, and UA92 certainly seems to be hitting the ground running with that that reputation. Uh, it's, nice love, to, it's nice to hear that as well. That our students as well have picked up on that. So initially. Maybe like you mentioned, Mike, that individuals were drawn because of the name and who we were and what we're affiliated to. Well, now we're quite proud that we have a number of student metrics there that speak for themselves. So yes, it's great that we are getting this publicity that maybe, a, I don't know if any other universities are trying to get up and running, but obviously we were able to get that head start and draw upon the quality networks that um, Gary and Lancaster have. But thankfully now, it's speaking for itself. So this novel approach that we've taken, the student satisfaction rates are very high. And um, the attendance is incomparable to even in previous institutions that I've worked. Um, how such a high level of attendance we have because we deliver either nine to one or two to six every day. So you can imagine if a student misses one of those sessions, that could be the equivalent in some courses of a week or maybe half a week's worth of material. So our attendance levels are really, really high. And equally, our grade profile is really healthy at the minute. Um, so we are having to obviously combine by all the rules of Lancaster, very reputable organisation. But even when those guys are external examiners and they go through that thorough process, our grade profile is very impressive too. But we are hoping that we have not to that, um, I don't like saying typical or traditional student, but a number of students may have additional care and responsibilities or they may be mature students because we know or the student will know that they're going to be a morning or an afternoon student throughout their duration of the journey. They can then, I suppose, essentially timetable or plan their life around it. And it shouldn't be a limiting factor that if they go somewhere else that come January, it's like, oh, all of a sudden I've got a completely new timetable who's going to look after my son, daughter, who's going to help me get additional, I don't know, pocket money, et cetera. So thankfully that students' metrics are also speaking now as well as what you've kindly highlighted. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and I always, I loved, um, I, I, I don't know where I ever le learned or thought to do this, but I always love learning about the philosophy people have because there's so many, there's so many throwaway philosophy statements which are almost just stocking fillers. And on the website for you guys, it's unlocking greatness. I love those two words. Just it, it, it says everything that you're trying to do in two words, sharing knowledge, making connections. And I know from the chats we've had previously that the making connections is fundamental in the ambitions of yourself on UA92. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's essentially probably fueled a lot of the conversations I've had with yourself or whether that be other sporting organizations as well. I am so whether it be my line manager or the HR or again, the board of executives leadership team, whatever terms you want to put on it, they are very keen for us to reach out and make those connections with industry leaders, partners, those individuals that have experience and or are able to share their experiences, whether that is actually coming into the classroom and or helping with curriculum design. So um, all of our courses at some stage, have um, been reviewed or been part of industry experts, whether that be academics like myself that are currently still delivering, or our academics, as I've heard somebody recently use the term, um, or whether it's like drawn on international frameworks, for example, and getting those individuals involved. So it's very much collaboration. Uh, because we are new and because we are trying to set up we don't just want to be seen as, oh, this is a fad or it's just going to be a flash in the pan. It's very much about trying to establish those long-term mutually beneficial relationships with key stakeholders. Okay, I, I will so openly admit how much I'm going to steal and abuse pracademics. That is fantastic. <laughs> I love that. I, I, love I, that. I wish I could claim it. That's, that's not one of my own, but yeah, there's no copyright on that one, Mike. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Uh, there's one as uh, uh, the other good one I've picked up this week from Ian Griffiths, who's a fantastic sports podiatrist. The boom in coronavirus 
uh, related activity, which is undoubtedly going to lead to some injuries. He's coined the, the uh, term overload, which I quite <laughs> like as well. Yeah. But um, so we are dealing primarily with a musculoskeletal audience. So as much as we know, there is a plethora of courses available to many different sort of skill sets and professions. If we zoom in a little bit to that sports element that you guys work with, tell us a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, so in September 2019, our newly launched sports degrees were sport and exercise science and physical education. So the sport and exercise science, um, there's two options. You can have your uh, honours degree, which is the full three-year degree programme, or you can enrol on a CERT HE programme. So, for example, it's trying to make education accessible to many. Um, obviously, it's not, you can't say all, because then the, there needs to be obviously some standard or some prerequisites in entry. But CERT HE is a one-year programme. Uh, if individuals do want to... Uh, proceed. Uh, it's obviously based on the pass and proceed model. Um, however, the BSc honours again has slightly different UCAS tariff points. Um, so again, that's the full year program. The sister is the BA honours, or uh, which is in physical education, and then it also offers a CERT AG, which I'm 90% sure on the UCAS is down as sports development rather than sports performance, which is the sports science equivalent. Uh, again, a full three year program. I guess on paper, there's certain uh, prerequisites, et cetera, that if you're doing a sport and exercise science program, as you well know, you're going to have to do your biomechanics. You're going to have to do your physiology. You're going to have to. So our core disciplines are very much the same as any other university. If people are suddenly saying that, oh, we've got this brand new sport and exercise science program, great. But where's the underlying fundamental principles that makes it a sport and exercise science program? However, how we do it, we would argue, is very different. So again, we've touched upon earlier the, the timetable, but actually the hands-on approach. So previously, it was individuals talking about, yeah, theory, large lecture groups, lecturing to 150, 200 students. That's not how we do things. It's small cohorts, lots of flipped learning, lots of blended learning approaches, whether that be through guest lectures, insight days, and or practical. So that's kind of a very whistle-stop tour of our two main ones. In the pipeline, which will be launched uh, this September coming, we have a sports management program. And then hopefully further along the lines, we'll be looking at your area of interest and your area of expertise to potentially uh, launch programs aligned to it and also sports coaching. Yeah, brilliant. Sounds like it's exciting times, exciting developments. Now, even in the world of musculoskeletal care and sporting injuries, there still, I always feel, appears a bit of a divide or a bit of a gap in the knowledge base between how exercise science, performance science, complements and works in tandem with the rehabilitation and the therapy. Now, we can split that into from a performance point of view and we can split it in an injury rehab point of view. But I would love to hear your thoughts on how those two, two things work symbiotically, how they can complement each other when there's an athlete or a patient in front of us. I think it would be important to kind of draw upon my applied experience to, to help answer this, so kind of stepping outside of the classroom for a minute. Um, because in my role as director of performance in a elite uh, female talent pathway, this is kind of one of the um, discussions that we regularly have. So we have individuals that are very reputable and have great experience as a, let's say, a sports scientist. And then we also have very good physiotherapists who typically work within the NHS nine to five and then maybe come across in the evening and do academy work, is, which is quite common for a lot of academy programs, I'm sure you're aware. It's two individuals have great expertise and understandings within their respective fields. But sometimes it's like, from my experience, not that they're speaking a completely different language, but it's not a language that is complementing each other. So one of the biggest things I try and get both practitioners and the individual I'm working with is actually take a step back and you hit the nail on the head. Look at it from the athlete's perspective. 
what what is the language and what is the language that that athlete depending on their age is going to understand first and foremost because there's no point in the s and c getting advice from the physio and but again the athlete doesn't understand it what has the physio diagnosed how have they explained that to the athlete and is the athlete able then to pass that information on to the s and c and vice versa so for me perspective taken from the athlete's point of view but also the language that is probably the biggest one for me is how can we get two individuals that are discipline specific experts to become interdisciplinary rather than working in silo yeah absolutely and i think you know we we love our buzzwords in the therapy world and patient-centered care is a big one which is is an accurate one and and suddenly when you remove the the injury element of it we quite, quite often forget athlete centered care mm. people don't have to have things wrong with them for a healthcare professional to be interactive and work in multidisciplinary to help those athletes so i know you're heavily involved in the youth sports side of it and our talent program now i think that's where again a lot of the therapists probably tentatively tread sometimes because we still have those outdated beliefs of what we can do with youth, youths and youth athletes. Um, any big take-homes, any thoughts that you have from your experience that would pass a message on to the therapist world, whether things you should consider when you're working with them, uh, overarching principles? Yeah, I think without echoing and repeating what we've said is obviously relationship building with the athletes and those around you. So we're particularly within our performance department, we have psychologists, we have nutritionists, et cetera. But how can we all work together to help whether the player is injured and or how can we proactively prevent injury? So one of the things that we work with and kind of our vision is we want to make our players as strong and as fit as possible, but in the bodies they currently have, we want happy, healthy players, but in the bodies they currently have. So something that may have worked Take, let's take the COVID-19 example. We have screened our players, we've fitness tested our players, we've drawn upon the latest research, journal articles, etc. We've identified imbalances, we've looked, we've logged it, etc., etc., etc. But these are going to come back very, very different players. And depending, obviously, on the years, their maturation status, um, are they pre or post PHV, it's essentially looking at the player that's in front of you and what can you do to help them or anticipate using obviously science and research, et cetera, to help inform where they're going to be because their bodies are ever changing. Yeah, that's really, really poignant stuff. Now, this is what we hope to be the first of a series or a number of sessions that we do in follow-up. Um, given a blank canvas, given the pen to direct that, how would you like to shape some of those things going forward? What are the, the topics and the areas and the, the things that you think that collaborative working can really make a, a difference for? I guess it's looking after, particularly if we look at youths, for example, it's very much the player, or sorry, very much the person at the center of the player. So we want to make sure that the person is in the best position possible. Uh, we want to look at any predisposing factors. Um, unfortunately, given the nature of sports, somebody is always going to get injured. It's inevitable, no matter how much we put in, there's going to be some resource. But what toolkit can we help provide the players with that if that unfortunate event, no matter the severe severity of it, if it's, again, based on perception, if it's low, medium or high, how can we have them draw upon the toolkit, essentially, that we've built to then equip them with the skills that they need to return Alongside that, it's very much trying to be proactive and um, trying to establish any potential imbalances. Can we then link up as a multidisciplinary team to, I suppose, reduce, because you're never going to, as you well know, uh, eradicate any predisposing factors. Well, how can we potentially reduce them to limit their impact? And then I suppose the biggest one is if an individual does get injured in the unfortunate event, what is the best return to play processes and strategies that we can put in place? How can we safely ensure that the individual before they're fully, explore, excuse me, fully exposed to 
I suppose, the unpredictable nature of the sport, typically in invasion games, how can we make sure that they're able to meet and potentially exceed the demands of that sport before they're fully released and before we're letting them spread their wings and fly again? So it's very much that staged approach with youth athletes, that return to play is something that if I've had every, all the best heads in the room, well, let's talk about the best kind of return to play profile. Yeah, that's exciting stuff. So I think for anyone listening, um, rest assured, when the time comes for those conversations to be developed, then we will be very proactive in reaching out to those stakeholders, associations, and individuals that we think can have a real impact in developing those. But likewise, if you've listened to this, you something that resonates with you and you really would be keen to get involved with them, then get in touch with us at the usual places for Sports Injury Fix, because we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to include you and get your input. Now, before we wrap it up, um, can't not ask you how it's going on your road to becoming Dr. Murray. How's the PhD going? <laughs> um, so far, so good. Thanks, Mike. It's probably uh, others are like, oh, he's still on that road. This is a long road. Um, thankfully, uh, things are going well at this moment in time. Um, I anticipate that all things will be officially submitted um, before July. So, Fingers crossed then we'll have to obviously wait and see when Vibas, et cetera, come. But fingers crossed it will all be uh, wrapped up in around the July period is, is the moment. Oh, that's exciting for you. Uh, we wish you the best with those. I'm sure everything will be fine. Where can the listeners find out more about yourself and more about University Academy 92? Um, so for UA92, it's... Uh, www.ua92.ac.uk um, have a look at our website there. there's obviously all of the details around course our call outs for guest lectures anybody that wants to get involved um, the, I suppose it's an open invitation particularly in the sports field we're very keen to build up in relationships like Andrew kindly introduced us maybe somebody would be able to be introduced you might be able to introduce me someone along the road um, Myself, uh, Twitter is probably more prominent at the minute. I set up a, a professional Instagram account to show the students uh, how hard could it be when you're getting up and running. So my Instagram account uh, is very much in its infancy. It's e.murray underscore coaching. Um, my Twitter account is at Murray EM4. Um, so it's, it's slightly better position. And then obviously usual LinkedIn, Owen Murray, et cetera. Um, I guess as well, Mike, if I just, if you wouldn't mind just taking the opportunity to, if any of your listeners are NHS staff or key workers or frontline workers, um, I just guess on behalf of myself and UA92, just really want to thank everybody for all of their efforts as well that they're doing during this kind of, I suppose, very strange times. Um, and again, very much thankful for their unselfish efforts towards trying to make this pandemic less of an impact. Uh, that's very kind and we definitely echo that. Um, I'm recording a podcast on the weekend with one of our sports therapy members who's gone back to work in the NHS and on the ambulances. So there are definitely people listening who, who will be uh, very proud to, uh, and, and chuffed to hear that message. Um, I think trying to keep it within our time skills that we're, we're looking for, um, I think some, a take home that I've really got from this is anyone working with athletes in whatever form you're at, if you can go to bed at night knowing that you've got happy, healthy players, then we're pretty much on the right track, and that's a fantastic target to aim for. Um, Owen, thank you so much for your time. Hope that you and everybody around you stay safe and stay well. And we very much look forward to developing this going forward and expanding this relationship that we've started to forge. Excellent. Thanks very much, Mike. And uh, thank you for anyone that's taken the opportunity to, to tune in and listen to me. I hope I haven't bored anybody too much. <laughs> Brilliant. Stay safe, everyone. Stay well.